Good morning, church family. It's good to be together, and I'm excited to be opening the Word with you this morning. It feels different standing behind a wall of boxes. I feel like I have my own little fort. I feel like I should be hiding down here making a pile of snowballs. Uh, But honestly, it is really exciting to imagine that within a month, each one of these boxes is going to be traveling around the world and is going to be in the hands of a child and just giving them a piece, a glimpse of the love of God. That's so exciting. So we thank you for everyone who's been a part of that and everybody who's going to continue to be a part of that. Uh, My contact information is up here on the screen. Uh, If anything comes up this morning, if you've got any needs, anything that you want to talk about, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to get together and sit down with you and talk through anything that is going on in life. Also, I want to remind us very briefly that uh, this is the last week to be, get involved in the baptism services. Next week, in both services, we're going to be celebrating a, a big group of baptisms. It's going to be a great day of celebration. If you'd like to be a part of that, definitely reach out to us. Uh, grab me before the end of the day and let us be part of celebrating that with you. All right, well, we have been moving through the Gospel of John. We're three months in, and this would be a great point to stop and reflect. You know, I've said before that as we go through long series like this, it's really helpful to reread the, the things that we've covered and remind ourselves of what God has spoken to you. You know, Jesus talks about someone who reads the word and then goes away and forgets about it, like somebody who looks in the mirror and sees their face, and then they walk away and immediately forget what they look like. But how often do we come on a Sunday and we read the word and we hear God speaking something to us, and then we go away and we don't act on it? And it just slowly fades away, and then it's gone. So I would really encourage you this week uh, to read through the first five chapters of John, specifically asking yourself, what are the things that God has said to me that I might have forgotten, the things that I might not have acted upon? Or if you're new to us and you haven't been a part of the series, reread those five chapters and get caught up with us and say, okay, what have we seen? What's been going on uh, leading up to this? Well, leading up to our passage today, Jesus has been traveling through Samaria and through Galilee, and then today he arrives in Jerusalem. And so we are going to be reading beginning in chapter 5, but before we read, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we thank you for your spirit which guides us into that truth. And this morning, we're not here today to hear from me or what I would have to say, but we are here to hear from you and what you would speak into our hearts. We open ourselves to you, and we ask that your spirit would do that work in our hearts today. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, beginning in chapter 5. It says, Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once this man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So once again, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem for one of the feasts. We remember that there were three feasts every year that the Jews tended to gather in Jerusalem for, and Jesus was always there to be a part of that event. He was always wanting to be around the people. Wherever people were, that's where Jesus was going. And John sets the stage for us in verse 2. He said, now there is 
That's a good reminder when he says now there is, that John is writing this as a first-hand account. John had lived with Jesus, he had walked with Jesus, he had been there, and so he's describing something that he himself was a first-hand witness of. He says in, in his letter of 1 John, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So John is a first-hand witness giving his testimony, and he's writing to the first generation after these events, the people who could go and explore and, ex and see exactly what John was writing about. So he says, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate is on the northern end of the temple complex, outside where the pastures where sheep were kept, and this is the gate that the, the animals would be brought through into the temple. And so outside of that gate, there's a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and in Aramaic, Bethesda means the house of mercy. We'll talk about that title a little bit later on, the house of mercy. And he said that uh, this pool was surrounded by five covered colonnades, uh, five walkways with a roof over them. And the first image that comes to our mind might not be correct, because the first thing that I pictured was a five-sided shape, like a pentagon, which would have been a really unusual architectural structure for that time. But this pool has been excavated by archaeologists. You can't see it really well in the picture because all of the layers that have been built upon it, but it's actually a four-sided structure, like a large rectangle, and there was covered walkways on four sides of it, but the pool was divided into two halves, and the fifth colonnade went down the middle, dividing the two halves of that pool. So you can picture uh, this large rectangle with two pools divided in half by another walkway, but that's only a part of the picture. The real picture that John is drawing our attention to is the people that were there. He said a great number, many, Given the population of Jerusalem at this time, this could be hundreds of people who were disabled, people who were blind, lame, paralyzed, people who were considered unclean, undesired, outcasts, not part of the community. This is where they would gather. And it was called a place of mercy, but I think more often than not, it was probably a place of misery. It was a place surrounded by pain, by suffering, by sadness. And when, I, when that picture comes to my mind, I think of all of the places that we drive by that are places of misery, places where people are suffering. I think of the tent cities. I think of the uh, homeless shelters. I think of the streets with RVs that are broken down, parked down the side, where people are living in conditions very, very much like this all around us. So this is not something that, this is, that is far removed from us. This is a situation that we walk through, that we drive by, that we're part of every single day. People living in suffering. You know, it's a place that uh, the Jews tended to avoid. They would take the long way around to not have to go through this place, but that's not Jesus. Jesus walks directly into places like this. He seeks them out, and he seeks out the people in these places. If you're reading the uh, King James or the New King, King James Version, you have another sentence after verse 3 that is most likely a later edition um, of a scribe trying to explain for us something that we might not have known about the time. And you know, if you are interested in uh, the textual evidence for the Bible or the, the reliability of the New Testament manuscripts, when we get to chapter 8, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that because there is such a rich um, collection of manuscripts that attest to the validity of the New Testament, more so than any other document in his history, both in terms of the number of manuscripts and in the closeness of those manuscripts to the time of their writing. This is the most well-attested book in all of history, so it is impossible to disbelieve the authenticity of Scripture but believe any other book of history. If you're going to throw out this book, you must throw out every historical book that has ever been written because this is the most well-attested book. But in verse 4, there's a, a verse that's probably been added in that gives us a little insight to something that we might not have known. And it says that there's this common belief 
among the people of the time that when this pool, which was fed by springs, but when this pool was stirred up, when it bubbled up, that it had some healing properties to it. And if people could make it into the pool, the belief was that they could be healed by that. And it doesn't say if anyone was healed by that, but that was the belief that they had at the time. And so it's going to explain something that we read in verse 7. And so you can picture these people laying by the pool, and it's right there. Help is so close, but they're unable to make it in to the pool. And so we can pick it up in verse 5 where it goes from this mass of humanity, this giant picture of suffering, but then it focuses in on one individual, and all of a sudden it becomes per- personal because this is a real person that we are talking about, somebody with real emotion, with real pain, with real life experience, and Jesus steps into his life. It says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, life expectancy at this time was 40 to 45 years, so this could be his entire life, or at the least the vast majority of his life, all he has ever known. He's been lying on this mat beside this pool, surrounded by suffering, dependent on the help of anybody that might pass by. That's all this man has ever known. And when Jesus sees him, he comes to him and he says, do you want to get well? And there's two aspects of, this, of Jesus' conversation with this man that, is, that are just heartbreaking. Two aspects of this conversation that we cannot avoid being moved to tears by. And the first thing that I find just heartbreaking in this conversation is that when Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? He doesn't say yes. We would think he would say, of course, yes, I want to get well, make me better. But he doesn't. Instead, he gives an explanation for why he believes that could never be true. And I think that what so often happens to us is that when we are caught up with something, we're absolutely immersed in something, whether it is a chronic disease, an addiction, a mental illness, an abusive relationship, a destructive pattern of behavior, we, we become completely caught up in something and it becomes all-consuming and it is all we know and it becomes our sense of identity. And it's all we imagine we could ever be. And so this man says, this is all I've known. This is all I am. You take this away and what do I have left? And I, so often we can let those things become our sense of identity. But that's not the way that Jesus sees him. Jesus sees him as somebody who is created in God's image somebody who is of incredible value, and somebody who is loved. And so if you're here this morning and you're caught in something and it is starting to form your image of who you are, and you're saying, this is all I am and this is all I can be, you need to understand that you're created in God's image, that you are of incredible value, and that you are loved. In fact, just a few weeks ago, we read John chapter 3. that said that God so loved the world, and not just the world in general, but each individual person in the world, that God so loved you that he sent Jesus so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world, to save the people of the world through Jesus. And so the first thing that we have to take out of this passage is Jesus' heart for people who are hurting. And that might be you, if you're struggling to feel Jesus' heart for you in your hurt, or that might be for the people around you, if you're struggling to see the people around you the way that Jesus sees them as people who are created in God's image, who are of incredible value, and who are loved. You know, this morning I got to hear from some of the people who came back from uh, the dinner last night at the, the Veterans a Tiny Home Community and how wonderful and healing it was just to sit in that community and eat with people and hear stories and share lives and be with people who are hurting. On Friday, I got to spend most of my afternoon with a homeless man who had just wandered up to the church, and we got to go out and have lunch together and went shopping together and got him groceries that he needed, and we got to just spend time talking and hearing what his life was like. I got to share the gospel with him and help meet some of his practical, physical needs But Jesus calls us to be with people who are hurting and to have that heart for the people around us. 
The second thing that is absolutely heartbreaking is the next thing he says. He says, I have no one to help me. That water that he believes would heal him is so close, but he can't make it the few feet to the water because he has no one around him to help him. And it makes me think of a very similar man in Mark chapter 2 who's also paralyzed, but this man has something else. He had friends. Because in Mark chapter 2, Jesus is teaching in a home, and the home is absolutely packed to the brim so that no one else can come in. But there are four friends who bring this man on a stretcher. And because they can't get into the, root, into the home, they pull apart the thatched roofing, and they lower their friend on a stretcher to get him to Jesus. He had friends who would stop at nothing to carry him to Jesus. And what a beautiful, what a captivating picture of what the church is meant to be. That we would see the people around us and stop at nothing to carry them to Jesus. Whatever people God has put in your life, whatever your sphere of influence, they're there for us to stop at nothing to carry them to Jesus. That's true not only of people outside these walls, but that's true of people within in the church too because the hurt, the brokenness isn't just out there. It's in here, isn't it? We are all sinners saved by grace. We all struggle, we all hurt, and we all need people to help carry us along. And I've said this before, but if you're here and you're hurting and you're struggling, and you've been praying, God, would you step into my life and help me with this? So often the way that God answers those prayers is by the people that he puts in, his, in your life. And so it might be that the answer to your prayer is sitting in this room this morning. Or it might be that you are sitting in here because you are meant to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. You know, when I watch movies, one of my biggest pet peeves, one of the things that I just can barely handle watching is when there's one person that has something, they have a piece of information or an item or a skill, and there's somebody else that needs it, and you're watching the movie, and you're like, if they would just talk, if they could just get together, everything would be solved. And as this omniscient outside observer, you see how simple it would be, but they miss each other, and they keep missing each other. I'm just pulling my hair out trying to watch this movie. But life in the church can be like that, because we can come in the doors, we can sit here for an hour, we can leave, and we miss each other, and we don't make those connections. So we need to be so purposeful about making those connections, about building the relationships that God uses to lift us up. I'm not saying life groups are the answer to everything, but life groups are one of the best ways for making sure that we aren't missing out on those connections. And so you heard about the lunch we're having today where the life group leaders will be there. It's a chance to get to know people and to find a spot where you might fit in. If you're not in a life group, stay and have lunch, right? If you... uh, If you already have plans for lunch today, scrap them. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Just stay and have lunch with us. It's so easy to do, and it can be the first step in developing the relationship, making the connections that we have to make so that we can lift each other up. Amen? Amen. All right. So our heart is broken by this man's image of himself, and our heart is broken that he has no one in his life to help him. But Jesus steps into his life and he says just a few simple words. He says, pick up your mat. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And in that moment, he experiences the life-changing power of God. And he becomes a living testimony to what God can do in a life. And that's who we are. Around this room, we are living testimonies of the power of God to change lives. Because in one way or another, every one of us has been this man. Every one of us has come out of something. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we go around this room and give story after story of, somebody, of people who came out of chronic illness, people who came out of uh, alcoholism or drug addiction, people who came out of broken relationships or domestic violence, people who came out of destructive patterns. And we are one living testimony after another of the power of God to change lives. With man, this was impossible. 
He never believed that this could be true. But with God, all things are possible. And so with one sentence, he experiences the power of, his God, of God and his life is changed and he becomes a living testimony of the power of God to change lives. I wish that that was the end of the story because that would be a, tra- a, a terrific climax. Amen, he's healed, he goes away, everyone is happy and they live happily ever, right? But then he has this encounter uh, with the religious leaders around him and they have a different take on what has happened. Because as he walks down the road as a living testimony to a life that has been changed by God, he comes across the, the religious leaders and it says, the, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. They know that this man has been lying here for 38 years and now he's walking down the street. And they don't say, praise God, you've been healed. Praise God, your life has been changed. They say, what are you doing carrying that mat? Don't you know that this is the Sabbath? And they say, they say the law forbids you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. What law are they talking about? If you've read through the Old Testament from cover to cover, I know many of you have. Did you read that? That's not a law in my Bible. That's not God's vision of the Sabbath. God gave the Sabbath as a gift to mankind as a day of rest, a day of recovery, a day of connection, a day of community, a day of healing, a day of restoration. That's what the Sabbath is meant to be for us. It's not a day of following the rules. But they've taken this gift of God and added their own rules and turned it into something that's not a gift, that's not life-giving, but something that is a burden. So the law they're referring to is part of their oral law. And at the time, they had this oral law that, had, that they had developed around the principle of keeping the Sabbath. And they had 39 categories in their oral, in their oral law of things that you could not do on the Sabbath. Not 39 things that you could not do, 39 lists of things that you could not do on the Sabbath. For example, you could not carry something that weighed more than two dried figs. You, another thing that you could not do is you could not move something from one environment, like this room, to another environment, like another room. So this man is carrying a mat, which certainly weighed more than two dried figs, and he's transporting it from one environment to another environment, so he's breaking these rules that they've set up for him. Man, the Sabbath was not about not carrying a mat. The Sabbath was about understanding the way God created us and living in a way that is whole and healthy and walking in communion and fellowship with God. Now, I don't know if you've had experience with with people like this. I bet most of us have, have with individuals who might claim Christianity, or even with whole churches who might claim to be following the gospel, but care so much more about rules, so much more about appearances, so much more about traditions than they care about people. That's not who we are. That's not who God created us to be. And so if you've had those experiences, Do not let those experiences form your image of who God is, of what Jesus is doing, and of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, because that is not representing God. Amen? All right. Again, in Mark chapter 2, he writes that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the final scene we see is the, the last encounter that Jesus has with this man as he seeks him out again. And it says in verse 14 that later, Jesus found him at the temple. That would be easy to read right past and take lightly, but where did Jesus find him? At the temple. Now, according to their law, no one who was um, unclean, who was, had physical deformities or imperfections, was allowed into the temple. So at least for 38 years, probably for this man's entire life, he had never been allowed into the temple. He's sitting outside the temple, within sight of the temple, day by day watching people go back and forth in front of him, into the temple, out of the temple. And for them, the temple was this symbolic visual representation of the place that God met with people. 
and he saw people coming and going, but he was never allowed in. And he knew that he would never be allowed in. So this is no small thing. When he's healed, and the first thing he does is go into the temple and go to meet with God. And can you imagine the first time he walks through those doors? Jesus has paved the way for him to return to God the Father. And it would be easier for us to misunderstand what Jesus said, says to him. He says, see you are well again, stop sinning, or something worse might happen to you. Something worse than 38 years of lying and suffering on a mat? What could be worse than that? What about an eternity of separation from God? Because as much as Jesus came to bring hope and healing and restoration in our physical life, Jesus came to bring eternal life, to restore our relationship with God and bring new life that begins now and extends into eternity. And so that's what Jesus is holding before him. You have been healed now, but you need to experience the healing that lasts forever. And when he says stop sinning, he's telling him to repent. Because sin at its core is nothing more than rebellion against God, than going our own way, rejecting God, refusing God, saying, I am my own master. And he says you need to turn from that and turn to God, to let go of that attitude of rebellion and take an attitude of trust and acceptance. So he's saying repent for the forgiveness of sins and experience the new life in Jesus. And it reminds me once again, we've ended the, with this verse several times, of John's thesis statement, John's main purpose statement at the end of his book. He writes in chapter 20, verse 30, that Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written. These things happened. Jesus did these things and John wrote them down for us. These are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. So what has God spoken to you this morning? How have you encountered him in his word? What have you learned? Or how have you been challenged? I hope there are at least four things that we have seen this morning. The first is Jesus' heart towards people who are hurting. And maybe you are the one that's hurting and you need to understand Jesus' heart for you. Or maybe you, or maybe you need to ex understand and experience Jesus' heart for the hurting people around you. The second thing that we've seen that we need to take away from this is the power of God to change lives. The third thing that we see is the role of the church, that we are meant to be people who will stop at nothing to carry our friends to Jesus. And the final thing that we've seen this morning, if you have, do not know God, is the invitation to new life that is offered in him. That Jesus continually holds out that information that whosoever believes in me will not perish even though he dies because he will have new, new life that lasts forever in God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for stepping down into our world into our suffering, into our brokenness, to heal us, to restore us, to bring us back to you, and to give us new life that begins now and lasts forever. God, I pray that for anyone here who has not experienced that, that you would move in their hearts, drawing them to you. And for those who have, that you would help us day by day to experience what it means to walk one step at a time with you, to be captivated by your heart, for the world around us and to be caught up in the things that you are caught up in. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.